Hi everyone, welcome back to Divided Films, the podcast where we talk about movies that audiences and critics do not agree on. Uh, with me as always is my co-host Keith. Hello! He breaks for no one. And uh, <laughs> coming back on the podcast today is Bobby O'Rourke. Welcome back, Bobby. It is a pleasure to be here once again. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you on, Bobby. And I'm very excited to talk about today's Divided film. It is the one, the only, Spaceballs directed by Mel. May the Schwartz be with you. I, fr- I should have led with that. May the Schwartz be with <laughs> May you. May the Schwartz and also be with you. you. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, directed by Mel Brooks. Uh, this movie falls into the category of having a rotten score with critics and a fresh score with audiences. So on Rotten Tomatoes, only 56% of the critics approve those fools and 83% of audiences wisely approve. And the critics' consensus, there is fine spoofery and amusing characters in Spaceballs, though it's a far cry from Mel Brooks's peak era. So, you know, that's kind of an interesting starting point for me because just I, – I will admit he has the, – the strongest part of the Mel Brooks catalog is from the late 60s to, like, mid-70s, right? And that, I think there's a consensus there. But that does not mean that his – that his other movies afterwards aren't enjoyable and funny. You don't have to compare them. You just look at this movie on its own. Spaceballs, you know, it's a comedy and it's hilarious. And, uh, you know, it's it's more of a direct parody than a satire. I think that's the other thing that, you know, critics are are seeing that there's not really much subtext or there's not much of a commentary in, in this particular film from Mel Brooks as he would make in, say, A Blazing Saddles, which is, I would say, his his best film. Uh, but, you know, it's all subjective. Uh, but, I mean, I grew up with this movie, so maybe I'm a little biased. Uh, but watching it again recently for the first time in a long time, I'm still laughing a lot. And I think this is still a very solid uh, solid comedy, and a solid parody. And if anything, with more and more Star Wars content being thrown at us, dumped on us by Disney every day, a movie like this, if anything, is actually more relevant than ever. Than ever. So, um you know that that's uh, my initial get go in this movie, but you know, Bobby, uh, get a start on your opinion too. Did you grow up with this one? Are you a little more um, prone to liking this? I grew up with Mel Brooks a lot. My 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 family has a long history with Mel Brooks. My parents' first date, I think, was to see High Anxiety in like 1977 or so, or somewhere in that area. And I I've watched Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein, History of the World since I was 11 or 12. So I am a big Mel Brooks fan. This one was one I always caught on TV or halfway through. I think this is the first time I've ever watched it end to end. And I gotta say, it's not my favorite. So I might take a counterpoint with you, Why, JJ, Bobby? Evolve. And I and I'm no. Uh, I, I even like some of the later era Mel Brooks where. He has like Dracula dead and loving it and Robin Hood men in tights, which are not his best, but I find funny moments in that. And there are funny moments in Spaceballs too, but I'm going to get into why I don't, I wouldn't put this on first. If someone said, I've never seen Mel Brooks, what should, what should I watch? Oh, I wouldn't suggest this one. That's a fair point. Uh, but I would say that this is not one to miss either. Uh, you know, cause I think there's quintessential Mel Brooks style comedy in this, even though it maybe it's not his, his most thoughtful or, um, you know, comprehensive kind of comedy. Again, it's less satire, more parody. Uh, so that's a fair point. Start him off with like the solid stuff, but you know, he's done such a such a large catalog of movies. I I you know, I I would be um, hesitant to say any any one of those movies to leave off. Uh, you know, to, to not recommend to anybody. But what what about you, Keith? Which one of us are you citing was the good Schwartz, the, the yeah. up Schwartz, or the down Schwartz? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I I love this movie. I mean, I I'll I'll say this. This is a good Mel Brooks introduction for kids. Ah, like this. Like <laughs> maybe, there's a lot of maybe not Blazing Saddles. I was introduced right? to it. <laughs> no, like or even there's a lot of humor in or I don't know. There's just a, there's a lot of jokes coming at you in this one, and I usually talk about. Um, when we would cover on the podcast horror movies that I would watch for sleepovers, we never really talked about comedy movies that were good sleepover 
uh, movies. This was one of them. This airplane, uh, a lot of Jim Carrey. But Spaceballs, just because we were also getting into Star Wars, Star Wars was kind of doing their their remakes. They were remaking them in the late 90s. So that, it, like that plus being introduced to Mel Brooks was like, dynamite for me plus my dad was a is a big Mel. we're all big mel brooks but my dad when my my dad laughs he loves the fart scene in blazing cattles he there's a lot like, it's strangely brilliant it might my, my it, yeah, exactly the same thing exactly i don't know why it's sh it shouldn't work i mean a critic i think i'm probably paraphrasing poorly but a critic once said of blazing saddles there's almost nothing redeeming in this movie but then a man punches a horse and you can't help but laugh and they're right <laughs> It works. I don't know why. Yeah, there's there's a charm to the movie that even the dumbest jokes you can't help but smile at, even if there's like no point to them. And I liked what you said though, Keith, about maybe for kids introducing them because the humor also at times is a bit more juvenile. And at the same time, though, it, it's like a little vulgar, but not too inappropriate for kids. Like, yeah, like 10, 11 is like a perfect age for this movie too. Also, like introductory to more. I would say like PG thirteen kind of comedies, you know, uh, as kids get There's older. There's some good bits. There's some good bits, like, yeah. uh, like, and the more appropriate humor. Oh God, combing the desert. You guys find anything? We ain't found shit. Like this yeah. is a very quotable movie. <laughs> exactly. I think everyone has their favorite jokes from this from this film. Uh, I one thing though, I I was noticing though is that there are a lot of fourth wall jokes. Right? Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. And they're everywhere. I didn't really notice as a kid how much of that there was. But yeah, now as an adult, I'm noticing that there's a lot of them. And I think each of them on their own is really funny. But I guess if I had to be a little more critical, I would definitely say that it's sometimes a crutch for this movie for characters to look at the camera, just to show like a member of the crew, to have rick moranis like you know, look you know make sure everyone understands the plot things like you get that. all that <laughs> yeah uh, i like i like all that i mean for me i always loved the the you know the tape of space balls you know instant cassettes and then they get to the moment in the movie that it is right now and it's this really um yeah this this really unexpected moment i like that uh i would say maybe my least favorite of those fourth wall breaking jokes is the stunt doubles it is it is still funny, but at that point it's like, all right, already, I get it. You know you're making a movie and it's also kind of like not that this movie is is aiming for airtight plot points, but it, No. I don't think you can accuse Mel Brooks of I, I love him, don't like I said, but I don't think you can accuse him of being airtight in any No, of no, but I'm saying it's like there's some, you have this, there's some leaks. they're trying to escape the space ball station and they get caught. Boy, it's just the stunt doubles. The other characters really made it out. How? Who cares? But at that at that at that point in the movie, I'm like, again, as as a more critical uh, viewing experience, I'm thinking like, all right, this has to be like the tenth time we're breaking the fourth wall here. There has to be other ways to lampoon this franchise. I liked so this will be another counterpoint you and I JJ will be on opposite ends I thought the fourth wall breaks were some of the best jokes and I didn't mind that there were a lot of them actually my favorite was when he Mel Brooks does Mel Brooks is a great musician in a lot of ways you know he wrote the producer's music and and he wrote for Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein um a lot of the music at least and when the John Williams surrogate gets in an escape pod with the big drum that he's pounding because the space station's gonna blow up I don't I just thought that was that was great the parts that stop me from enjoying it as much as others was actually what happens to a lot of comedies I think where they sort of pause for a joke to land to an audience as though it's a play the jamming joke is the one that gets that that most sticks out of the whole joke is just there is jam on the radar and the movie sort of stops and those were the weakest points for me of the writer's saying you have to enjoy this look how funny this is and it was it was the quick moments and the, the beats that just sort of happened one by one that most that most uh, i most enjoyed so i don't know if that keith i don't know how you felt about the rapidity of the jokes that came through uh see i love the the bit after that like i always love good wordplay and maybe there was a pause but the stuff with like michael winslow that's the stuff i go back on youtube and like rewatch, and i guess like for me, as I was watching this movie, and it's been a while. I mean, I always if it's it's been a while since I watched all of it. I'll say that. So I really appreciated that. 
But I kept going, like, why did the critics... There was, like, even Ebert was like, I laughed, but that's not enough for me to recommend this movie. And I kept saying, like, what is it? And I don't want to take my nostalgia in it because I would recommend this movie. I, I don't think people knew that, I, that this genre would go away. And I'm not, and that's not saying like, oh, Men in Tights and Dread, Dead and Loving It, which are also uh, uh, divided films. And I would place this higher uh, up, uh, than History of the World. But that's, and that's, Whoa. that's very close to me. <laughs> it means a little bit more to me. It means a little bit more to me. Just one spot notch, sir. Don't like Bobby's like standing up and fuming around the room. I'm right pretty now. sure now, Bobby. I, I, I yep. Yeah, let me just test my um, my knowledge of our friendship here. I'm pretty sure History of the World Part One is your favorite Mel Brooks film. Is that correct? I it's either that or Young Frankenstein. So I thought I came here with with friends, and I I came to be ambushed. And I really appreciate it. <laughs> Surprise. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know. <laughs> Again, everyone has has their favorites. I I also really enjoy uh, History of the World. I'm not uh, saying I don't but, enjoy it, but I this one means a little bit more to me than uh, History of the World. I'm the one. I feel the I feel all the eyes on me now. <laughs> well, you know what? I'll, I'll also take it back, <laughs> just to you know, save by the bell here. I'll also uh, go back to another thing you made, Keith, when you said you know, people people didn't think the genre would go away, or you know. Uh, something to that effect i also think that the other genre people weren't sure would go away or not was this like sci-fi genre that obviously Spaceballs is largely parodying star wars but also you know it gets its alien scene in there it has a lot of star trek jokes etc but i think at the time this movie is released it's i believe four years after return of the jedi and 10 years after yeah. the first star wars movie so i think at the time it feels a little dated to make a Star Wars parody because it seems like, you know, the window for that had closed. However, time, I think, as we always say, is the best judge because the Star Wars, Star Wars is always going to be in culture. It's always going to be, it's ubiquitous, right? And I think that wasn't as clear in the late 80s as maybe some people were moving on from Star Wars, but it still had its fan base. And then, you know, now it's it's Star Wars is is never going to die down in popularity. It's just we're getting more and more content of it every day. So that's why this movie, a parody of it, and the things that it's kind of uh, lampooning, not just plot wise, but also as a franchise building. I like I like those are probably the smartest, so um, the smartest points that Mel Brooks makes in this movie. I mean, my favorite fourth wall break actually, uh, just from like a thoughtful point of view, is the whole merchandising scene. You know, with yogurt. Oh mm-hmm. yeah. Because, like, in 1987, it was already, like, a super merchandise franchise. And that – what was made then is nothing compared to all the merchandising done on Star Wars now. Like, every day. It is it is crazy how much Star Wars stuff that there is these days. And, and in the movie, I think there's at one point you see, like, a Spaceballs toilet paper, <laughs> you know, with the, the, yeah, the title on I it. I did laugh at that. You know, it just – it gets so out of control. So, then anyway, this movie was kind of foreseeing – how out of control that merchandising would get. It's crazy. You can't walk into any store without seeing a Star Wars something. And, um, yeah, it's, like, good good for the franchise and all. But uh, I think it, it does come across – it does it does remind you that it's, it's more commercial than anything else. And uh, I like that Mel Brooks reminds us of that. In a movie that's largely just about uh, surface-level jokes, that was one I thought that was more thoughtful. Merchandising, merchandising, where the real money from the movie is made. Spaceballs the t-shirt, Spaceballs the coloring book, Spaceballs the lunchbox, Spaceballs the breakfast cereal, Spaceballs the flamethrower. The kids love this one. Last but not least, Spaceballs the doll, me. May the Schwartz be with you. Yeah, he really hit the nail on the head. If he had only known how merchandisey this whole genre would become, he would he probably is baffled and didn't know how prescient he was being. So, hats off to him there. You know, the man was prescient. I'm only saying my I think that 
he's done better. So I'm not, and the problem with being Mel Brooks is when you've done some of the best comedies ever made, you can only be compared to the best comedies ever made. So that's that's why well, Spaceballs that's never ranks super high for me. Does every movie he has to make have to be the best comedy ever made? He has a great, like I said, late sixties through the seventies. He he's just like hitting one great comedy after another. But is it okay for him to make an okay comedy or just a good comedy? This is, I agree, it's not a, it's not like an amazing comedy. It's, I would say, it's a good to very good comedy. But that's okay. He doesn't have to, you know, be uh, reshaping the mold every time. So I think he just wanted to make this movie, and maybe again for at the time it seemed like it was a little dated. But I think uh, he got a really good handle on what to poke fun at, and it's again it. it with comedies, if it makes you laugh, then at a base level, you can't say it's a bad movie. If it makes you consistently yeah, laugh certainly. from start to finish. Right. Did it make you laugh? Yes. Okay, then it, it was at least partially successful. So, yeah, I, I agree with you there. I've, I've laughed more at other movies he's done, and I think it's a little dragged down by the leads, which isn't entirely their fault so like i i thought i think bill pullman is is very compelling and daphne zuniga did a good job i didn't think their jokes were particularly funny and when compared to what john candy's given and what merc moranis is given so i i enjoyed their parts a lot more and i think that was because of the writing because it's hard to be a straight man in a comedy you have to be either the brunt of the joke or you have to kind of deliver the lines that aren't jokes and i think that that's a tough spot to be in right i think that they aren't really meant to be the funny characters in the movie i think that maybe they have some moments here or there with you know reacting to each other they get in some lines here and there but for the most part most of the comedic weightlifting is done by as you said john candy and rick moranis i mean if anything the funniest parts of the movies are when we're with the Spaceballs characters than rather when we're following the heroes right and I mean, for me, Rick Moranis steals the show. He's just consistently oh, the I miss funniest him. person. He, he's, he's so great in this movie. I mean, the physical comedy with him. I just love how things are always like falling on him. He's getting hit by something or he's being embarrassed in some way. I just I just love that, that he is constantly on the short end of all these jokes. He's, he's really great at playing that off in the frustration. I mean, you know, scene after scene that he's in. He's just, he's I don't think he's played a, an antagonistic part like that before. Usually he's the endearing hero or the nice guy dad in in so many other family comedies. And here he he's he's on a whole other level that I don't think we've seen him in any other movie. He has my favorite joke of the whole film. And my favorite part was when they kind of cut Rick Moranis loose and let him do whatever, because it's the moment where he tricks uh, um, Princess Vespa into coming out of the hiding place and he as Darth Vader with this imposing figure when he turns back into himself and and, and does away with the illusion of being her father he goes fooled you I, <laughs> just such a stupid line it's really I love it I love that moment so much that I actually say I, I reference that line all the time just like when I'm like watching something of any other media where someone is tricked by another character, I do think back to that Rick Moranis delivery of "fooled you." <laughs> it is so juvenile, but it is he delivers it in the perfect way. I mean, uh, uh, throughout the rest of the movie too. I mean, come on, what is with you, man? <laughs> it's it, he just has the, the voice he's doing too. It when when he has the helmet on, he's doing this voice, and you might think it's like someone else doing that voice. It's all him. It's all him. And I wish we saw more movies where Rick Moran is, is this more like, I don't know, outrageous comedic character uh, instead of always being like the down to earth guy, which he was certainly great at too. No, it's uh, a, I, and I, I, I miss him and stuff like I, and granted he retired from acting for legit reasons, but I wish he came back outside of a commercial, but no, he, you're right. The, the leads bill pullman does his best like yeah it's not but, his fault yeah, oh yeah not his fault i think he was like really new to uh film acting i i think him uh mel and and bancroft saw him in a play because i think mel wanted tom i think he mel was trying to get everybody to be in this movie like whether it was tom hanks or tom cruise and then they have him and his wife saw him in a play and it's like that's the kid that's the guy i want but yeah, you're doing. I think you're it's going a good up, choice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're going up against like 
you're, you know, even Joan Rivers, you're going up against like the, the like comedy legends in this movie. Like, uh, and I, it's kind of like, uh, you're, he made this movie, a f it, it, it was like the latter half of the, like before the decade, his last movie was history of the world. It's been a few years. Like this is almost the start of, it's a, it's a new audience for Mel in a way. Like he kind of, you know, his next three movies won't like hit it like they used to. This is like, uh, what would you call mid period Mel? I guess you'd say I'd this say is late. when he's he, he's trying to late period maybe. I mean now because the man's ninety five now and still still going strong. So it just depends career on wise, when he's not life wise. Late, career wise, <laughs> career wise. Because <laughs> um, uh, Blazing Saddles comes out in seventy four. I think he's already. 44 45 years old when that comes out so he's you know what by the time he starts making his hits he's not a, a young man really like so Spaceballs comes out in 87 so he's 50 or 60 at that point maybe something like yeah, that yeah he sure. looks like he's at least 50 north of 50 uh in Spaceballs when he's playing president screwed and <laughs> it's amazing i also like how he plays two characters in this movie i feel like that's a great touchstone of a lot of his films where you know he plays one character for most of it but then he has a scene where he's like you know, some other character. I mean, in history of the world, he plays like several characters. You know, he's, 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 it, it kind of goes back to like the old 70s comedies with like, you know, Peter Sellers or some of these other actors who would don multiple parts in one film. You know, you don't really see that anymore. This is kind of the last remnant of that. I kept saying to myself when watching this movie, I'm like, thank God for Blockbuster. Because I, no, really, <laughs> like, I think uh, this movie definitely had like kept going and became I, this movie is it, it's not only found an audience but it is like part of our pop culture like it like even though it has a 56 on Rotten Tomatoes like people quote it it's it's up there for a lot of people's top comedies it's like not cult it's it's a success even though I don't think it's like a, a smashing box office hit it, it's still a, a success but thank god for Blockbuster because that's how you know, that's how I discovered it. Um, and I was wondering if a movie like this or like a comedy like, you know, not studio kind of comedy can make it in today's like streaming world age. And maybe I'm trying to think of examples and I'm sure there's word of mouth adds a lot to it. But I was like, I, I don't know. It's, I, I, it's, it's a whole new world for like these mid-level comedies. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it's tough because I don't think these are, you know, unfortunately, like parody movies in general have been absolutely ruined by, uh, you know, <laughs> oh, no. just like the last couple of decades, not to get into those terrible parodies. Uh, but but we can compare them, though. I think that that's, that, you know, we could say what a movie, despite some misgivings, what Spaceballs does right and what, say, Disaster Movie doesn't, uh, well, doesn't quite first nail, of, you know? Yeah, I mean, for starters, like, a good parody or satire really sticks to its genre, right? And, like, in all of his, in so many of his really great genre satires, he's really sticking to, like, one story and one particular movie he's making fun of and, like, throwing in little bits of other movies. But for the most part, mm. there's really, like, a focus on one main storyline. And then, of course, in these really bad parodies from over the years, in the last 15, 20 years, they're just, like, throwing every single movie that was out, in the, you know, at, at the time and parodying it with, with no purpose. So there's, like, a love for the genre and everything he makes, especially, you know, like, you know, westerns or, you know, the old black and whites, you know, um, Hitchcock movies. There's, like, you can tell there's a true understanding of why those genres are good and appealing and you know making fun of them but not trashing them either at the same time right it's like you know they're like send-ups to those kind of films and i think there's a sense of that here and this this is not like a hateful movie or saying like star wars is bad this is just you know if anything it kind of adds to it it's kind of like oh you really like star wars it's 1987 you're not going to get another star wars movie in a long time but here's a little star wars parody <laughs> that kind of gives you a little taste uh, in the meantime, while you wait uh, another, you know, uh, twelve years for the bad prequels to come out, but you know, here's something a little bit to hold you over. There's a definite love of the genre, like love of the movie, love of the genre involved, as opposed to like trash. Like, I, I, it's like you know when you're watching disaster movie or any of those kind of movies that I think stop playing in theaters because. Uh, but Mike, I. 
I might be making a monkey's paw. Like I always used to say, like, oh man, I wish these movies uh, would make a comeback. And I don't know if that would like. I don't know if that would be like a really good one. I, I still don't know if I would go for it, or I, and I or, or maybe I just don't know. I don't even know what a good modern day spoof movie would look like. It's tough because I think you're probably right. It's uh, go, it, go go ahead, JJ. You can okay. First. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I was gonna say that it's tough because it what whatever is popular nowadays. I think you have a lot. We've seen so much kind of parody by now, anyway, good and bad. That if you were to take any popular genre now, like obviously Marvel movies, for example, I think it's kind of obvious what a movie parodying it would do. So you lose a lot of the humor there. I mean, well. Uh, what I think the magic spark you need for any good parody movie is you know, turning turning the genre upside down in a way that the audience doesn't expect, and that that's really hard to do nowadays. I think if anything, you see parodies and satires in smaller formats. Uh, you know, people like uh, on on social media, on YouTube, you see people doing like you know smaller kinds of things. But for a feature length parody, uh it's it's really tough to sustain audiences. There's only one for that long. I, you'll, I, there's only one kind of like, just like an a movie making fun of like Oscar bait movies. I don't know why that one sticks out in mind, but like it, you you're not making fun of maybe the movie itself, but maybe kind of like what the movie represents. But yeah, that's that's right. It's it's this feeling of you're right, JJ. I think you have to have a love for it, and even if you don't like movies, you can write a spoof or a parody of a, of a movie genre you don't care for, but you have to sort of love it in some small way. And Keith, you're right. They're not direct to scene spoofs. That's kind of the problem I think we face so often is they're, they're making fun of scenes. They're not making shot fun of, for shot chop, remakes, shot for but shot, but then yeah. just making it like gross or something, and that's that's not interesting, mm-hmm. right? Like we know the original scenes. I mean, this might sound, you know, I I, I have a, I have a lot of friends who really like not another teen movie. I actually do not care for that, <laughs> and I've even I'm had, one of those friends. I know, but just hear me out because this podcast is coming apart. Everyone's fighting. This is I the don't end. Like it. Just, this is the let it be of divided films, but. Uh, <laughs> Or is it the Abbey Road? It depends. But um, <laughs> that's a deep cut there. I'm just saying. Bobby's the Yoko. Yes, Bobby. <laughs> uh, but my, my point I was trying to make with not another team movie is that it does those things. You have recreation, like like shot for shot recreation setups of scenes from um, like Cruel Intentions or some of the 80s movies, you know, some of the older ones. Or, or She's All That, you know, like 90s and 80s teen movies. And they just make it gross. They just like, you know, they have like scenes with like people throwing up or, you know, there's like a whole like diarrhea sequence and there's like, you know, an old lady making out with somebody. It's just it. I, I'm not sure what they're trying to say or about the genre by just making it nasty. And that's that's kind of like the note that I would have for a lot of the really bad ones that came later that decade is just like, oh, like date movie. She has a giant pimple and it's really nasty. And, like Gross. I mean, I, gross out humor. I don't want to like totally say on a blanket statement that it's it's all bad, but you know, you can't just take a scene that we are familiar with and just have like someone throw up, and then that's that's the, that's the parody. That doesn't like it doesn't make any sense. It's like what uh, a child would think of. Keith, you were saying what's the most successful version now or in recent history? I guess of these. Sorry if you could hear the motorcycle outside my home. Um, I, I, they, they're not quite spoofs or parodies, but to my mind, the most successful one is probably Edgar Wright's Cornetto trilogy because Shaun of the Dead is about zombie movies, but it's really about people who are lazy and basically already zombies. How do they react in a zombie apocalypse? And then Hot Fuzz is a send up of the police, the, the police action films, and, and World's End is, a, is an alien movie. And Mel Brooks really makes Spaceballs a movie, like you said, JJ, about what is merchandising gone amok. What if you start making movies that are purely about selling toys in, in some way? And it's also, you know, he throws in some low level gross jokes, but they're, they're mostly fun and in good taste. You know, they're, they're, they're not meant to be the main meal in, in, in a lot of the ways. It's like, they're more like spices, you know, it's not like, 
Yeah, you know, they, they, they're, they're done All more spice. economically, you know, and also they're actual stories to the good ones. I mean, yes, they're basically like kind of copying the original stories of the actual movies that they're parroting, but there's an actual coherent story you can follow in Spaceballs uh, and, and so forth. Or like, like you said, I love like Hot Fuzz, for example, there's an actual story there and then you know, it blows up and gets ridiculous at the end. But at least you can still follow it. Again, the bad ones, it's like there's no story at all. It's just like a mishmash of other movies that don't really work when you put it in the editing room. What the hell am I looking at? When does this happen in the movie? Now. You're looking at now, sir. Everything that happens now is happening now. What happened to then? We passed then. When? Just now. We're at now now. Go back to then. When? Now. Now? Now. I can't. Why? We missed it. When? Just now. I think I just came up. I uh, thank you for great answers to my question. Uh, I think I came up with another um, answer as I w- as you guys were going on. Maybe that maybe the TV or the movie. Those movies are dead, but I forgot that JJ and I got into a show when we lived together, and it kind of like blew my mind about how fun it was like I, i'm like oh wow i haven't seen a show like this in a while angie tribeca that is a great spoof show that parody Never is saw like it. uh it's rashida rashida jones say rashida to leave rashida yeah, jones gonna, yeah. i was gonna say rashida to leave <laughs> uh it's rashida Before jones a Congress and, person. and like there's a bunch of co- like every episode there's a bunch of comedy people that you know and i think alfred molina plays the doctor it's based it's making fun of like you know, cop dramas, modern day cop dramas. Right. And it's it very does, it's, I like it's very much in the same vein as the naked gun in terms of the kinds yes. of jokes, the timing of the jokes, the delivery of the jokes. Everyone's very straight faced while there's a lot of absurdity happening. And I think Steve Carell also was like a, a producer on the show. Like, I think he wanted to also was yes. I think it was also his attempt to try to revitalize that style of humor as well. And I think that ran for maybe like four or five seasons. I think it was on like TBS. Uh, but yeah, but they are making they are making uh, History of the World Part Two into a TV show. I don't know. Uh, it's going to be on Hulu. Oh, okay. So maybe okay, okay, maybe okay. maybe th- that genre is not going to find any more life in movie form. But maybe it's it's there in TV form. Yeah, short form I think is where their true parody is going to live and true satire. It's it's unfortunate because. It's there's an alternate universe where we still got consistently good parody movies, and you know you, you would still see them. But um, I don't know. I mean, it, it, again, in the internet age, I think people, um, yeah, every, everyone has like an interesting take on their favorite genres. So I think that's also why it's it's something you're going to see better online is because like you know the biggest fans are going to be making that sort of content. You know, again, because they love it and they know the right way to like lampoon it and put a new twist on it. Um, and it didn't seem like, yeah, like, like, for example, like Mel Brooks, you know, he's the auteur here. He's the one who's able to go in and do it masterfully for all these, you know, different categories of film. Uh, it seemed like for all the bad ones, it was, you know, like these, you have, you have like the bad parody movies are conceived in a marketing meeting. Like, here are all the popular movies now. Just, yeah. just get some actors and make fun of them however you want, you know, without any... And churn them out, you know, make one... You know, there was a period where scary movies were coming out, you know, once a year. There was a five-year period where every year there was one. They were like the Saw movies, you know, you just... Diminishing returns oh, every yeah. time. And, you know, credit where credit is due. What Part of what Mel Brooks is really good at is mixing the highbrow and the lowbrow because there's a Kafka joke in here who's that for except for me i laughed at that and i'm sure if i was in a movie theater i would have been one of the few who tittered at that but then they have a joke about the schwartz rings you know one being bigger than the other you know it's this constant (laughs) high and low oh yeah it it works you know in a lot in a lot of ways it works and when it, it when it doesn't land at least you could still see what he was going for, even if the joke doesn't necessarily land. Everything. Yeah, I, I, I even for not like not the best jokes, there's still like a cadence that, like I feel like Mel Brooks humor. There's this sort of like sort of cadence to each joke that is so signature to his style, and I think that's that's not just from how he writes it, but how he directs it. And even if something doesn't work, it's done in a sort of affectionate way that you can at least like smile or something. Like 
I don't know, like something that is totally pointless is when President Screw gets like the twins' names mixed up. Hello, Marlene. Hello, Darlene. It's a totally pointless sequence, but it's done in a way that I can't help but like chuckle a little bit. Like I, it, I, I don't know. I don't know why, but um, it's just his style. It's the more you watch it, the more you kind of catch on to the rhythm of how he delivers these jokes. And I laughed at that one, I think, because it didn't stop the movie. And I, again, that's so this was filming in the 70s and 80s, too. I think comedies particularly were very stagnant. I don't know if you you both felt this way as well, but a lot of the shots are wide and there's no movement of the camera. And this was just filming, I understand, 40 years ago. So there's not much we can do there. But that joke was almost thrown away and I liked that because it wasn't a star of the scene it was just Mel Brooks mixing up someone's names and not caring at all or screw brother the character and just moving on it was the moments when Rick Moranis would sort of look deadpan at the camera and say the joke that I would sort of get lost because I'd know you can you can make this scene really dynamic and really fun and mo- and it can move so quickly. And then instead we stop basically the whole movie. So this joke can be said and then we move on to the next scene. Yeah, it, but that might interesting, be my interesting because in that regard, I get what you're saying where you have like a setup of the characters interacting and it's not like it's cutting or it's not like, yes, you know, it's, it's like you said, it's, it's very um, stagnant on that shot of all the characters and almost maybe it's staged like a play in some degree. Yeah, you know, the way that it felt very much like a play. all the characters are kind of facing the same direction at times, and like you said, sometimes they they wait as if you know to give the audience a chance to laugh and then continue things like that. Uh, so, yeah, I mean that's and maybe just goes back. You know, Mel Brooks, he he's he was writing comedies and and again like the producers and everything. When you read some of his scripts, it kind of feel like almost like more like a like a play than a screenplay. At times, like almost vaudevillian in a way. Yeah, yeah. Like, it, 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 like I, mm. like that's how I like. I feel like I definitely got that outside of producers, which is an obvious like. Re- read like a play. Uh, I feel that way with Young Frankenstein as well. It's like that. Like okay, we're now going into this bit. Here's the set. Here's the stage setup. Here, it, like, the little jokes that are going to happen within this one giant bit, and then we move on to the next scene. Like it. Yeah. Part of the reason I like Young Frankenstein amongst amongst them all, it's either my first or second favorite, is because it's almost not a comedy. The jokes are sometimes so subtle that you have to watch, you have to really pay attention to the movie. Or just accept that weird things happen, and, and Spaceballs probably tends toward the other, other end of the spectrum where... It's very much about the slapstick and the, and the Pratt Falls and the banana peels, which is, you know, fine. But it's uh, of those movies, I think that of the Pratt Fall Mel Brooks movies, I just I've seen him do better. I th- in my opinion, History of the World has sort of the similar vibe. And I just think the the Inquisition song is uh, is good. Not to say the Spaceballs song isn't good, too, but I like the Inquisition song. better. Oh, I kind of rock out to that Spaceballs theme song, right? It's better than I remember. I have right, to say right it's before better it blows up. Um, I mean, like uh, some of the. Some of the jokes I didn't like as a kid, I like more now. Like that opening shot, that long, it's like a full minute of that giant ass space ball. That always ship. made me laugh. <laughs> Flying by. I think as a kid, I would like fast forward through that. But I just, I do appreciate how, how long that shot is. And then, you know, the transformation at the end, you know, to the maid, I, I thought was really funny. One thing actually I, I don't really care for is how they throw in a random plan of the apes jokes towards the end. Like, it kind of works because the head looks like the Statue of Liberty, but to me, it seemed like that was, like, a real big throwaway. And also, like, oh, this is also sci-fi. Let's throw in a little Planet of the Apes jokes there. I think they could have skipped that one. Well, I feel like it Like th- it also allows it to be set up as a sequel, which I'm, I'm kind of happy they didn't do. Well, it's mm. all of it. I mean, like, yeah, there's no History of the World Part Two, right? I think he always liked to tease the I, tease mm. the idea of sequels without actually having any interest in doing them. You know, Star Spaceballs Two: The Search for More Money. I mean, like, that's that's so on point. Uh, I wouldn't I'm glad. be surprised would be, if he saw a Force Awakens and going like, I could, you know, maybe we could get like the get. I could work, I could with, work this. with this. Well, even technically, like this is chapter eleven of the Spaceball yeah. saga, right? In the opening scroll, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Spaceballs, <laughs> chapter eleven. I also just like, and I, I have to say too, like, um, the name—it's a very immature, like, you know, Spaceballs. 
you know, it's just you see the home planet and everything is like a ball and everything. It's just he's not going for subtlety in this movie either, Mel Brooks. And I think that's something that the critics wished he, he kind of stuck to is, you know, the, the humor is way more obvious and a bit, you know, a bit more, um, yeah, a bit more immature, which is why Keith, you maybe say this is something like introduced to kids, Mel Brooks. This is the movie to do it. Um, you know, it's it's not. It, it, it's sometimes a little more juvenile than, say, maybe a critic would would prefer Mel Brooks to do. But it's not the most. It, it's it, you're right. It's it's not the most absurd or uh, off- offensive. I don't mean that in the way people will will be offended, but more Blazing Saddles and History of the World are filled with a lot more vulgarity and a lot more pointed adult humor and space balls you could give to an 11 year old like you yeah. said and, and and they'd enjoy themselves yeah. you can't give an 11 year well maybe you, my parents gave it to me so i can't say that but an 11 year old there's a couple of jokes that happen in in the history of the world that an 11 year old won't understand at the, at the time oh, no, i mean that's half the fun though of watching some comedies with your parents is yeah you, know, you don't get all the jokes at first and then as you get older you uh you know you understand more i mean for me the worst movie my parents probably showed me that i would not understand as a kid was something about mary I would think, I, yeah, I, I don't know why they let me watch it with them. There's a blockbuster rental, I think. I had I couldn't be older than seven years old when we watched this, and I didn't understand half the jokes in that movie. They're laughing. I don't know why they're laughing. What's that on your ear? Like, I, I, what's funny about that scene? I, I didn't know at the time. And then you're know, watching it so many years later. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, how, how was I able to watch this? And we still don't know now. I've never figured it no, out. Why is this movie It's so still funny? a mystery to me. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> you know, when you're a kid, you kind of like watching some of the – even if you don't understand the joke, you do feel like you're now part of like – you know, um, you're doing something you're maybe not allowed to. you know, Because even though you show this to a kid, there's quite a bit of cursing in it too. you know, Like, you know, I'm surrounded by assholes. <laughs> like that whole bit. That, the that's also yeah. a great bit. I love that. Everyone except one guy I noticed that this time raises his hand. Like there's just one guy. <laughs> I like, <laughs> And that just made it funnier for me. Uh, oh, God. And the, and the plan of the you, – you're right. He kind of – I wouldn't call it a cheap shot, but the Planet of the Apes is a bit of a throwaway. I did really like the alien uh, bit where John Hurt reprises his character from Not 1979 again. Alien to be, it, that, <laughs> to be that all works. Uh, eaten out of again. That all that all works, but again, it's another sequence that really it's like a coda to the movie because this is after the cli- the movie's over. Right, by that it's point. after yeah, the climactic absolutely. destruction of of the space ball one, and after the plot is spoiled. So at that point, it's like. They're just, they're just throwing in something else. I, I still live for it. I still like that one a lot. I also get a kick out of that Bill Brooks did not care at all to establish any sense of like time period in this universe because you have Planet Druidia where everyone is dressed like it's like the Renaissance or something. And then you have that space gas station where it's definitely like the late 80s rock and roll or something <laughs> it's like there's like no the waitress has a blowout yeah yeah, yeah there's like no <laughs> consistency <laughs> as to like what period you're drawing from he just is kind of and, I, and again i i think that's funny maybe even unintentionally so that it's like whatever it's in outer space you know like dress them up whoever we need them to uh you know i feel uh, like the the diner scene is like even though like the movie's over like it's one or two scenes away from being over itself. That is like everything that Mel Brooks knows about stage acting, comedy rolled into like it even ends with like check please. Like, like there's it, a good cadence to that whole sequence. Exactly. You know, like you had to add the it. jokes. That's probably an example of more of what you were looking for, Bobby. Is more of the quick paced jokes. You know, like the tail going up the one waitress's skirt, and then yeah, you know, like there's all these things going on in the background. So I I think that. That has like that's more Spitfire scene, and that's why we like it. Even though, again, totally pointless scene, but uh, it's it's definitely hilarious, and we're glad he he kept it in there. I wouldn't be shocked if that scene was cut from some version of the script, and Mel Brooks or one of the other writers just said, "Can we just stick it on the end, yeah. please?" Because it, it doesn't it adds nothing to the movie, but it is it is yeah, an it could be scene, it could so have been very be well the cut. beginning. Yeah, that would make more yeah. sense actually to introduce the characters. Uh, it's but it, you also get that really crazy Pizza the Hut joke too in the beginning, which again it's an obvious thing. How do you parry job of the Hut? Make him Pizza the Hut. Oh, but he he is that's the most revolting. I was genuinely squirmy watching Pizza the Hut because you could see the human yeah. eyes underneath the costume, and he was melting and 
uh, I know Java is supposed to be gross, but Pizza the Hut honestly you could tell, unnerved me a you little You can tell bit. the actor in that costume is totally miserable. And also... <laughs> and not yeah, Don DeLuise. <laughs> No, no. I mean, the, mouth, the, the, the way that the, the costume is speaking is just the, this disgusting fat tongue just like moving left and right. There's like, there's no sense to how this thing is talking, but it's just a funny, obvious joke. Like, Pizza the Hut. I just like how they say the character's name at that point. It took me years um, to realize that Vinny was based off of Max Headroom, but that's also because we're not child of the, we're not children of the '80s, and like it, I had no Max Headroom is for like upper echelon pop culture enthusiast like it's it it, it doesn't like it doesn't it goes over a lot of people's heads but i was yeah i never i never understood that character other than robot sidekick yeah i just thought he was just like a frank sinatra or something yeah (laughs) you know uh the the mannerisms there i I just it's still funny if you don't really understand the reference you don't need that private we're right here now what is it now what is it? I'm having trouble with the radar, sir. What's wrong with it? I've lost the bleeps, I've lost the sweeps, and I've lost the creeps. The what? The what? And the what? You know, the bleeps. <laughs> the sweeps. <laughs> and the creeps. <laughs> That's not all he's lost. Uh, you know what, though? Adding that, adding that scene at the end, though, with the alien reference, I think another, another advantage of that scene is that it does add to what is a pretty short run time for this movie right i think this movie goes by very fast as an adult appropriately yeah which you know hey the star wars movies are very very Mm. long so you know there's i kind of like this is like the shortest star wars movie you're ever gonna get it's like a solid like 85 minutes which which i don't mind um so yeah without that scene it'd it'd be like even a lot shorter but i i like that i mean the, the movie moves very fast and you know, I, I didn't really feel like dragging or anything, even though, you, like you said, some of the jokes maybe take their time a little bit. For the most part, it's like a very fast-moving movie that knows what it's, that knows what it's doing, and it makes for I think um, a pretty enjoyable experience. I mean, everyone has their favorite moments yeah, in this movie. True. You know, Keith, you you, met, you mentioned that um, yeah, this has a fan base. It's not it's not just cult fan base. I mean, it is like a solid fan base that likes this movie. And yeah, I like I know my mom's favorite for this movie is the ludicrous speed. I mean, that's like a classic comedic <laughs> set piece. I mean, everything about that whole sequence is like really fun. And I always look fun. I always look forward to watching that sequence. Everything about it is is, you know, great. Um, but yeah, everyone can pick and choose their favorite moments. from it. They don't all work, but a lot of it does work for a lot of people. And I think that's why some people go back to it time and time again. I agree. And if I could just, I'll, I'll, I can give my honorable mention jokes too, which I, which I just, I love John Candy when they're in the desert and they go, they're traveling with the suitcases and uh, Bill Pullman says, well, we're almost there. And then John Candy goes, you said that three dunes ago. Like that, that, (laughs) 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 like that's just such a funny, it it just, it just works. And I love that President Scrooge, Mel Brooks, in bed is reading his own autobiography and it's called don't blame me which is it's these little tiny things that aren't this that's that's where i think the movie is is strongest when the these little tiny bits come together and make for just really funny throwaway lines that no one pays any attention to and they just keep moving down down the line i totally agree i think that really can make a comedy feel more complete is when you have those little moments that don't have anything to do with the subject that you're lampooning. It's just a funny moment for the sake of having a funny moment. And I think John Candy sells a lot of those kind of things too. Like it's some of his like physical comedy, like when he, you know, her royal oh, is she's last luggage. You know, he's like holding the luggage in his mouth for some reason, and then he spits it out. Like he, John Candy, um, is it, he's almost like he's kind of unrecognizable in all that makeup, you know, as as barf. <laughs> And I think a lot of people think of like John Candy movies. They think of like, you know, maybe like planes, trains, and automobiles and some of his other. Same year as that, too. Right. But it's interesting because John Candy usually is like such a center stage for a lot of his comedies. And here he's more of a supporting member of the cast. And uh, he doesn't even get like most of the jokes. He gets probably most of the jokes in his scenes, but he's not the first person you think of when you think of uh, Spaceballs, interestingly enough. Um, he's like a warm hug, but he, his whole his whole persona yeah. in Home Alone, you know, Home Alone and Stripes. Every time he comes on screen, you just feel you just feel good. 
It wouldn't be the same movie no, without him. Not at all. Right? I think he, he oh, helps definitely. he helps elevate the movie for sure, but it's it's interesting that um yeah, he he's he's not as center stage as he usually is. But um yeah, he I he kinda I think he fits into that world of Mel Brooks mm-hmm. very well. And I, I, am I mistaken in saying that this is the only Mel Brooks film he I was ever so. in? Because he delivers no. a lot of those, even like the corny jokes that normally wouldn't work. I think he still sells them in a way like funny. She doesn't look Jewish. Like that's like a, that's that's really obvious and lame. You know that joke was going to be made, but he says it in a way that's that makes it work. Like no one else. Yeah, can he say sells that line because there's a lot of Jewish jokes here, and and some of them. Are... I love old man Jew Jewish humor. <laughs> and John Kenny's your guy. <laughs> No, Bell Brooks. This movie is full of like uh, old man oh, Jewish yeah. humor. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that never gets old. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it's it's like funny because Spaceballs. You could definitely say is not Mel Brooks' strongest movie, but it is a quintessential Mel Brooks. Like you watch it, and you know not just from because he's in it, but it's it's uh, it's so recognizably him, right? And I think at that point in his career, he had earned such a reputation for having a distinct style of humor uh, that, you know, this is kind of like for him, like he's just doing whatever he wants. We just, you know, it, it works and he's already like earned his dues. So if he wants to make a silly Star Wars parody, then he can do it and it'll it'll be really popular. So um, I think that's kind of maybe where the movie stands in his legacy. In some ways, his greatest heir in that sense of putting himself in is Lin-Manuel Miranda because he's also you know writes roles for himself and everything and there's that sense sometimes of some people saying like did no Brooks need to be in this one I don't know and like there there is a whole section of people who love these movies who are like it would have been stronger I think if Mel Brooks didn't cast himself in two or three roles throughout the movie I I often like it and then and it happens in a in in Blazing Saddles and and like we said a bunch of other ones in in Dracula Dead and Loving It. But it is interesting when a writer slash director casts themselves in a movie how 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 it ends up you know can can reflect a lot on the film. That's a good point. I think it works in this movie though because as President Screw and as Yogurt, he's really delivering the the main the main like what he has to say about Star mm-hmm. Wars that's coming from those two characters. So it works because those are like we're pretty much all the commentary is coming from whereas like yeah i like high anxiety did he need to be the lead in high anxiety well, like yeah, yeah probably not yeah you can get anybody to be in that movie but you know he wrote it and he's in it and it's still a really funny movie mm-hmm. yeah i like high anxiety too not so fast lone star helmet so at last we meet for the first time for the last time Before you die, there is something you should know about us, Lone Star. What? I am your father's, brother's, nephew's, cousin's former roommate. What's that make us? Absolutely nothing! Let's get right into our final thoughts then on Spaceballs and our percentage scores. Bobby, uh, what's your score and final thoughts? Let's you know, it, it occurred to me this was the first time all three of us had discussed a comedy where I, w- I was on because uh, Hook, Fast and Furious, and Space-, Space Jam, I guess, is kind of a comedy, but not in the way that this is. So, you you know, you brought up a good point, which was, did it make you laugh? And that's the main goal. If it did, it was somewhat successful, and if it didn't, it wasn't. I was going to come in a little lower with this score, but after talking, I'm I'm going to give this movie a 60 right on the cusp because I think when you are Mel Brooks, and I, I this goes for basically anyone who's top of their game, you're always competing against yourself, I think. And I mean that in a good way. I, I truly love the, the, the this comedy style. I love Mel Brooks, but I've just seen these jokes or this type of joke done better in four or five movies and it's not bad but it just this one just skirts the line of okay i'll watch it when i i there it wouldn't be the first mel brooks movie i'd I'd root for but there are a lot of jokes in it that i that i like a lot so 60 is my score all right i guess that's okay (laughs) don't hate me uh uh that's that's all right i don't know if this would be an escape pod for you though when we blow up (laughs) the space station here uh yeah yeah i'm gonna jam out to that later uh, okay, well, what about you, Keith? What what uh, what's your final thoughts here? I still stand by that this is like not only like baby. This is like baby's first 
comedy yes. set. Like I, I would definitely give like na- this Naked Gun. Uh, and you will get a very you'll get a kid who wants to make a podcast about movies. That's how that's but I I think this movie is still popular today because people are still finding it and it is fun for all ages in a way that um, his other movies aren't yet <laughs> like you know you have to grow aren't. into that uh, but it's it's funny. There are bits that on I go on YouTube and just watch and it still makes me laugh. Uh I'm going to give it a 75. Wow. I think it's it, it's I, and believe me his co- there he has mastered some comedies. Like I think his uh I think Young Frankenstein is up there in comedies for me, but it's this one's a solid 75. Like it's it's not something I watch all the time, but I'm really happy to have watched this again. Okay, 75 for Keith. Yeah, I um, I agree. I guess I don't go back to it a ton, but this was a sleepover movie for me as well, Keith. I showed this to a lot of my friends. Yeah, I discovered it and I showed it to all my friends, and you know, it was like a household staple. And yeah, it was my introduction to Mel Brooks as well. But I, I still really enjoy it. Maybe I do have a soft spot for it. Sue me if that's the case. But I think you know going back to it every several years um, is is going to maintain. You know, I can't watch it all the time, but I, then I'll find more faults. I'll fall to the the lower Schwartz like Bobby. <laughs> but uh, hey, I came here as a friend. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you did, <laughs> but uh, it's it's always going to hold a place in my heart. And I agree. I, I kind of maybe you don't group it as a Mel Brooks movie. You bro- you book it as one of these kind of late eighties parody movies like again like with like naked gun or um you know like what a major league or i don't know some of these like late 80s 90s parody movies so i would give this actually a 78 <sighs> percent. okay i guess i'll <laughs> Bye, right. I, I don't not approve i'm just i i i just I, i've never been the bad guy this is new for me now that now you know how i felt when we were talking about Hope. yeah you and I'm, it, it feels awful i don't want to do mm-hmm. that to anyone ever again Whoa, I'm the one who gave Hook like a, and I always, that one, to go back to like our, one of our, I think our fifth episode, uh, I gave Hook like a 50 something and I hear from many people like, I love that movie and I, I feel bad about it. And then I like, there's stuff to like, and then I think about it and then I'm like, it's my score. I'm sticking with it. You're right. JJ, Keith's the enemy. Let's get him. (laughs) We've all, we've all we've all um, angered the general audiences every now and then, but not this time because I think Keith, our final score will get get us closer to the audience. If that's correct, I am very satisfied. Once uh, a solid seventy one, seventy one, seventy seventy one percent. So kind of in the middle between the two scores, but definitely closer to the audience score. So I can safely say that on Spaceballs, we are siding with. The audience. Yeah, I just realized this too, Bobby. We talked about Space Jam. Now we talked about Space Balls. If we get you on again, we have to talk about another thing that's Space Something. Ooh, what's left? Uh, space Odyssey? But that's not a divided film. Well, I don't know if that's a divided film or not. What other movies have space in them? Uh, anyone have any suggestions? I'm sure there's a lot of people to... who watch Space Odyssey going like, I don't get it. What's yeah. that monolith doing here? Well, I don't like monoliths. Why the ending? <laughs> was there was there any yeah, was there any 2001 references in Spaceballs? No, right? I don't think there's there's No, I don't, no, think, I don't think so actually. I think every other sci-fi every other popular sci-fi movie up to that point was referenced except for You know why? You know why that is cuz he did that in History of the World. History of the World opens up with that Dawn Dun- of Man yes. sequence where with there's that, just a bunch of apes sequence. humping everything the music sequence too right like Mm -hmm. the the famous score that's you know done in a million other things okay that's fair he already he already did it he (laughs) He could have hit the baby though like i like i wouldn't i would not mind that uh (laughs) that humvee like watch out for the space baby (laughs) i do i do (laughs) where's that that joke yeah i do like that uh winnebago the space winnebago i would totally yeah winnebago that's it yeah i i would definitely uh use that as my spaceship it's cozy 
Uh, but all right, Bobby, thanks for for joining us uh, for Space Balls. And uh, you know, I hope you're not the one who gets hate mail like Keith did when we did Hook. So you know, hey, time that. will tell. And and any publicity is good publicity. Thank you both for for having me on. It's it's always a pleasure to be on with you too. You know who says that? People who only get bad publicity. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but you, you'll get good publicity. I promise you that, Keith. Uh, I promise you that, Bobby. But um, you know what? Uh, we'll have you um, We'll have you on to, to talk about something that yeah, the audience agrees on, just in case. You know, a little insurance there, just so people know <laughs> that you are not a snob. You're a man of the people. Yeah, that's what I try to be. Uh, but thanks everyone for listening as always and uh, look out for more Divided Films soon. Mm-hmm.